I have some remarks that my son Jack wrote um, about uh, Lieutenant Governor Habib. And so I'm going to read those, and you can imagine me as a 27-year-old man. <laughs> so just close your eyes for a moment. And um, OK, wait a second. Um, so here, this is Jack speaking now. Good evening and welcome to the New Frontier Awards. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, President Kennedy was many things, but more than anything, he was young. He was the youngest man ever elected president and part of a new generation that asked what they could do for our country. That's really what the New Frontier was. It wasn't just an agenda or set of policies. It described the fearless, patriotic spirit of a generation that welcomed the call to serve. We're here tonight to carry on that tradition, celebrate young leadership, and we're reminded of what has always been true in America. Progress and change depend on the energy, optimism, and boldness of young people imagining a better world. I think every generation has felt what we're feeling now, anxious and uncertain, frustrated by tired debates among the same old guard, but nothing gets better when we throw up our hands. So it's our job to light a candle, to shine light where no one's looking, and find the people who are working towards a brighter future. That's exactly what Lieutenant Governor Cyrus Habib is doing in his state of Washington, where he's held elective office since 2012, when he won a seat in the state's House of Representatives. From there, he moved up to the state Senate and was elected Democratic Whip by his peers. And then, most recently, in 2017, he was elected lieutenant governor after he won a competitive primary and ultimately general election on the ticket with Governor Jay Inslee, making him the first Iranian-American to hold statewide elective office in this country. It seems like people really like Cyrus. In fact, during our selection committee, I heard over and over the same thing about him. He's incredible, smartest guy you'll ever meet, a star. Everyone loves him. The more research I did, the more unqualified praise I heard. I wanted to find out the real story, so I spoke to the most unbiased source I could find, Judge Susan Amini, Cyrus's mom. She told me how her son had lost his sight at eight years old, battling cancer as a child. She told me that she did whatever she could to help him, but really that Cyrus was the leader in his own destiny. She gave me an example. Cyrus learned to ski as a blind person. He'd call her after day on the mountain and enthusiastically say, Mom, I fell 20 feet, to which she would reply, OK, great, do it again. But what about his political skills, I asked. Was he always so convincing? Apparently, he was. Whenever he got in trouble, she told me, he would debate with his mom until she was convinced she had made a mistake, not Cyrus. <laughs> and before our conversation ended, Judge Amini slipped in just one more interesting fact about her son. He climbed Mount Kilimanjaro last year. Uh, yesterday afternoon, um, uh, my daughter was over, who's just written a book about climate change, and she had uh, recently interviewed Governor Inslee. So we reached out um, to him to see if he has had any uh, words to add um, about his lieutenant governor. And this is what he sent this afternoon. Um, Cyrus is a constant inspiration, not just because of his elected office, but because of his life. All parts of his life inspire every day. He's done great things for Washington State, and this award is a recognition of his accomplishments and what he will do for our state and our country in the years to come. And if all this weren't enough, the lieutenant governor has a strong record of achievement on critical issues like education and climate change. This is Jack now. His scholarship program has changed students' lives and let them see the world and the Inslee Habib administration is among our nation's leaders on aggressive climate change policy action. Lieutenant Governor Cyrus Habib challenges the rhetoric we hear today about a new generation of Americans that doesn't care, work hard, or get things done. He's done all of that and more, and I'm honored to present him with the John F. Kennedy New Frontier Award.
Thank you, Ambassador Kennedy, and let me begin by uh, sharing my gratitude, um, uh, not only to Ambassador Kennedy, but to her son, Jack, um, for his kind words, um, to everyone who's made this possible, the Institute of Politics, the Kennedy School of Government, uh, the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library Foundation. Um, and uh, I want to thank a few guests that I have here with me, uh, without whom I wouldn't be here. Um, three individuals who uh, got me elected and who have made sure that I haven't then squandered that position by messing up too badly in office, by being really my closest advisors, trusted friends, um, and um, staff throughout these uh, seven years that I've been in elected office. Libby Hollingshead, Miranda Roberts, and Christina Brown, who are all here. And I, I, I hope and I know that every elected official who wins this award, I'm sure, uh, says and knows this, that um, we are nothing without the men and women that work with us, work in our offices, and make it possible for us to do the work of the people. They, they, they don't often win uh, and are, don't have the opportunity to win awards like this, but they are what makes this country great, what makes our government work so well. Um, I want to thank the uh, uh, friends that I have who are here. Thank you for celebrating this with me. And I want to uh, uh, thank and um, offer my full-throated support to all the young people who are here uh, for this conference um, and my excitement for all of you. Uh, let me say a couple things about family because um, this is a, a Kennedy event and I think um, it's impossible for us to think about President Kennedy without also thinking about his family and uh, that's most clearly on display here um, with his beloved daughter um, and his grandson's leadership of this committee. Um, but let me talk about my parents for just a quick moment. Um, my father passed away in 2016 just a few weeks before I was elected lieutenant governor and after a three and a half year battle with cancer. And um, I'll tell you why I know he's smiling down on me right now. Uh, it's because, uh, you know, coming from an immigrant family, um, what's, the, what's the biggest uh, and, and highest and best hope that every immigrant family has for their kid? Um, it's not health or, or happiness uh, or even prosperity. It's actually that they go to Harvard. Um, and, and so, um, and so, uh, and so I, I wanted to make my parents happy, and so I, I actually applied early decision to Harvard, and di didn't get in, um, and, um, but went to a, a fantastic university, I went to Columbia um, for college. But then when law school came around, um, you know, my dad knew that I'd, I'd gotten good grades, so he was excited that I was gonna apply to law school. He thought maybe I had a shot to get into Harvard Law School. And so, I did, I applied, and I did get into Harvard Law School, but I also got into another law school. It's, it may be dangerous to mention it here uh, in this town, um, but I got into Yale Law School, and so I'll never forget when I went and told him, you know, Dad, uh, I've decided that I wanna go to Yale Law School. And my dad goes, wait, I, but I thought you, you did get into Harvard. And I said, yeah, I, I, I did. And he said, well, I don't understand. <laughs> Why wouldn't you go there? And, he's, and I said, well, you know, this focus on public interest, and this is where I want to go, and whatever. And, and he said, all right, well, we've never told you what to do. Never, you know, we've always supported you, encouraged you, whatever you want to do. But here's what I'll tell you. You go to Yale, study hard, get your degree, and then you can frame that degree. I'm going to take the admission letter letter of acceptance from Harvard Law School, I'm gonna have that framed and keep it. So that was his love of this institution. So now, finally, he knows that I've received an award, let's call it a degree, that I've received recognition from Harvard University. So I know that he's smiling down from heaven. And without him, without him coming to this country and finding a new frontier as an Iranian 17-year-old, Finding the University of Washington, I wouldn't be here, wouldn't be in the United States, wouldn't have been able to enjoy the benefits of this country for a person with a disability. And then my mom, and you heard Ambassador Kennedy mention, or Judge Susan Amini, who uh, uh, inspires me each and every single day uh, as a public servant, one of the first Iranian-American women to run for anything in this country. 
Um, and I often tell the story of how when I was in third grade, I'd recently become blind. And uh, the school where I was going uh, to third grade didn't, didn't want me to play out on the playground with the other kids at recess time because they feared, well, in part because they knew that I'd become blind recently, in part because they knew my mother was a litigator. They thought it wouldn't be a great idea to have me play on the playground equipment, so they kept me by the sidelines while the other kids were having fun. I went home and told my parents I was being excluded. My mom went to the principal's office the next day, and she took me with her so I could learn from her how to advocate for myself. And she said to the school, I'm gonna take my son to your school and I'm gonna teach him how to get around the playground and use the jungle gym and the swings and slides and everything and he's gonna learn his way around differently, but he's gonna learn his way around and have fun just as well as any other kid. And then she said, you know, it may happen that my son might slip and fall and he may even slip and fall and break his arm. That's a fear that any mother has. But then she said, I can fix a broken arm, but I can never fix a broken spirit. So I wanted to tell you about my folks Again, in part because that's part of the Kennedy legacy and the Kennedy family way, but also so that you understand how it was that I was able to find my new frontier in this country, in the great state of Washington. And so let me just say one more word about new frontiers. Um, I think if you look at those two words, you can find something special and important about each one of them. Why did he say frontier? You know, there's another word that I think probably a lot of politicians, unfortunately, these days would, would use instead. Maybe instead of a frontier, they'd talk about a battle line, right? They'd talk about, you know, a fight across lines. So instead of a frontier, a battle line. And I think what's, what's important here is that for President Kennedy, this wasn't about a battle with some other force or an opposition. Keep in mind, the new frontier that he talked about 60 years ago this year was not a set of policy initiatives, though his presidency had many of those, short-lived as it was. But it was about pushing oneself across that next horizon, across that next boundary, to go out into the playground as my mom inspired me to do and allowed me to do, but to go out and take risks and to push oneself and to keep one's spirit from being broken and in fact to grow one's spirit and to grow the spirit of the country. And so that's why I think it's so important that President Kennedy spoke of a frontier, not, as we hear about all too often these days, a, a battle line. And then new, a new frontier. And this is so important, you know, I was, at the library, the Kennedy Presidential Library earlier today, and I was struck by how, in a mere two and a half years, that administration tackled so many challenges, domestic and foreign, that you would think it was a two-term presidency. Right? You would think it would be it was an eight-year presidency with what he did in less than three years. And that's because there was a boldness to him. There was a boldness to his vision for our country. And so we need to remember, as we strive for those frontiers, let them be new frontiers. Let us not retread those struggles and battles of the past, but inspired by young people like the Christinas that you'll hear from in a moment, from Freedom for Immigrants. Let us be inspired by all those who are calling us to new challenges, to new frontiers, to boldness rather than the modesty of reduced expectations and social media call-out culture. So I think about New Frontiers in a new way, having received this great honor, and I, uh, and I, and I accept it with tremendous humility. Let me say one final thing, which is that um, to Ambassador Kennedy and to her son who's watching and to others in that family, that as someone who has suffered from cancer myself multiple times. As someone who lost my father to cancer, uh, it's extremely inspiring to know and to hold up as role models in this country individuals who have suffered tremendous tragedies and then virtually immediately turn their attention to how they can 
tend to the needs of others, to bind up the wounds of others, to take care of others. It's so hard. You know, as one of our great writers said, the world breaks us all, but some of us learn to grow in the broken places. And President Kennedy's legacy, while it shouldn't be by any means reduced to his untimely death, does also remind us through his children, grandchildren, the loss of his son as well, um, it all reminds us of how much pain this world can inflict, but that whether it was for him through the inspiration of Catholic social teaching that meant so much, or whatever tradition it is that inspires us, that we can be called to overcome that pain and suffering, perhaps best when we put others first and put ourselves to the service of others. That, to me, also is the meaning of the new frontier. So thank you, Ambassador Kennedy. Thank you to the committee and all who have made this possible. God bless you all.